So thank you very much uh, for the presentation and the organizer for the invitation to look at this uh, nice colloquium. It's very nice to be here. And uh, I decided to talk about a recent uh, part of my uh, research activity. And uh, I decided to talk about Bayesian things that can be called Bayesian. So this is about Bayesian multiple testing. And the general ideas uh, that I have for recent years is um, to model the hidden structure in data using dependent structure uh, in, in a prior. So uh, it is a very, very general idea that uh, part of algorithms work well because uh, of some hidden structure. It can be a low dimensional structure and you can model it or not. But uh, here I will focus on the idea of dependence to model the hidden structure. So here are two examples in which uh, I have recent works uh, about this idea. The first one is about deconvolution. I will not, I will not talk about deconvolution today, but I'll just explain the idea. Is the deconvolution is the situation where the observation is the sum of a signal and a noise, where the signal and the noise are independent. And in general, in the convolution, you assume that you know the noise, or you know the form of the noise, or you know a lot about the noise. And then recently, well, it was built on earlier ideas, but we have discovered that when you split here your signal in two components that are not independent, and in the same decomposition here, the, the components are independent, then you can recover everything without any knowledge either of the signal or of the noise. So putting some dependence on this model uh, allows to recover everything without any knowledge. So the second topic which uh, is on this slide is the Another very old question about population mixtures. In which uh, the observation have a density or a distribution, which is a convex combination of other distributions, which means that Given some non-observed latent population structure, you have a distribution here. And of course, uh, if you do not put any assumption somewhere, then you cannot recover the individual distributions because of course you can, for instance, split the first one and then put it with the second one uh, to get another population, decomposition, and it is not identifiable. But if you assume some dependence in the latent structure, then you can recover again everything. So that's what Judith said uh, yesterday, and I will explain this later uh, in this lecture. So the general idea is that you can describe dependent structure in the data, in the hidden structure, by putting dependence. So I will focus uh, on uh, two subjects about which I will talk about this recent research results. But uh, in, the, in the meantime, it, it will give me the opportunity to 
give some general ideas uh, about important subjects in statistics. So the first subject will be multiple testing and using Bayesian methodology to do multiple testing. And the other uh, subject will be the use of non-parametric hidden Markov model priors. So those uh, works were done with uh, several co-authors, so it's my pleasure to, to show them and to say that uh, I think this general idea of uh, having dependent structure on latent variable came from uh, uh, old, not so old work with Judith, uh, where she pointed to me a paper by Yao and other co-authors where they had some simulations where they had population mixtures, but they put some non-parametric prior with hidden Markov model and it all worked. And uh, it was uh, not believable, in fact, at that time. And uh, this made us discover something here and something here. And then uh, the ideas grew up. And then um, the more recent ones, papers I will talk about are with Ismail, which is truly Bayesian, and Kweku and Zachary, the three on the top. But uh, there, was a, there was a lot of, stock, of stuff with uh, Sylvain, Luc Le Hérissi, Judith, uh, Johan De Castro, Claire Lacour, Alice Klenen, who is here also, and Stéphane Robin. So the outline of the two lectures, but I don't know at which point I will stop today, but, uh, will be first, again, multiple testing and empir empirical bias methodology. So most of this part uh, will be general even I introduce, even though I introduced the hidden Markov model prior, uh, most of the, this part will be general and can be applied to any model you choose, you choose to, to model your hidden structure. Then uh, I will talk about non-parametric hidden Markov models and I will take a time to explain why they are identifiable and what you can do with that. Uh, essentially why they are identifiable. But then at the end, I will talk about something uh, which is somehow some different subjects, but I believe is very important in statistics, is asking the question, uh, what are the limits of what I'm doing? Uh, what can I say? How far can I say that what I say has a has an importance, so can be true, or can hold. So I will talk about the fundamental limits of uh, the use of uh, hidden Markov uh, when you approach the uh, independent case in which you are no longer identifiable, and if you use your algorithm, what will happen? So first, about uh, multiple testing. So what is multiple testing? In multiple, multiple testing, well, why do I say multiple? It's because I don't have only two hypotheses, but several hypotheses. You face several questions, say capital N questions, and I will decide to describe it through a latent uh, indicator theta i. And I want to test between theta i equals zero or one, based on data. which can also be collected regarding the, the index i. And the multiple testing procedure is something that for each i says whether uh, it's the null or the alternative which, uh, which is true. For instance, uh, so of course, as I, as I said, I will consider dependence on the modeling. So I consider situations in which uh, there is some idea that you don't have uh, all independent data. So for instance, you can think about uh, genomic uh, questions along the DNA. So this was the story of the 
this paper that uh, Judith pointed to me. It was a paper by Yao and other co authors in 2011 in Journal of Royal Statistical Series, Society Series B. And uh, the question was to uh, decide copy number variation along the DNA. So the copy number variation is the hidden structure. And uh, you have uh, a gradation of macroarrays in which you have for each position of the DNA. So I is the position in the DNA. And there is another interesting application that I can talk about is uh, disease monitoring. When you have uh, data, for instance, about incidence rates, and you want to decide if you have an epidemic event. And of course, in, those, uh, in all those situations, you have two types of errors, as you all know. And uh, you want to make, uh, you want to, to control your errors. So it's mine. <laughs> So sorry about that. Um, so what I didn't say is, of course, that uh, your data, of course, depends on the value of the hidden structure. And then you want to control the errors. And uh, the goal in general in multiple testing is to control false dis discovery rates. You don't want to make too many discoveries because uh, discovery is uh, the alternative. Because if you, for instance, think of disease monitoring, making a discovery is thinking that there is an epidemic event, so you have to, to, to build uh, some strategy to control it, and then it has cost and uh, uh, you want to control this, which is the expectation of the ratio of the number of false discoveries uh, divided by the number of discoveries. But also you want to be able to detect true discovery rates. So this can be seen as the power of a test. You want to maximize the, num the expectation of the true discoveries divided by the number of positive. So this has been an old subject in statistics, uh, and it regained a renewal interest uh, with the development of large databases. And with the, there was this uh, very important paper by Benjamin Hirschberg uh, in 1995, where they discovered a procedure in which, if you think a little about the error, the, the um, level of your test, that is when you make the error of deciding a discovery when in fact there is no discovery to discover, uh, then you should divide roughly your uh, level, your alpha, your probability of uh, error by n, the total number of hypotheses. But then, of course, your power, the other error becomes very large. And they discover the a way of uh, controlling the false discovery rate by using a, a threshold that is uh, set according to, so here I describe it as they do using p-values. And in the setting where when the p-value is small, then you reject the null. Uh, you order the p-values and you compare it with a threshold depending on which where you are in the ranking. And doing so, they proved that with uh, independent experiments, when the excise are all independent, then the false discovery rate is controlled by the level times the proportion of uh, null in your whole set. Then there, was, uh, there were several papers to understand, uh, does it still hold when the experiments are not independent, or how to modify it? when they're independent. But then also, when you use p-values, you come to the fact that to construct the p-value, you need to know the distribution under the null. So there, was, there were works and what, what to do if you do not know the null. And 
the answer today will be that all this can be answered using some dependent prior, uh, which of course applies in the setting of this prior. So if you, it depends on which IDs of Bayesian IDs you follow, but, uh, well, I'll not discuss, I will not, uh, I'm not going to discuss such things. So here I put a prior on, um, on my data, on my uh, unknown theta, so where is it? So here I will say that I use hidden Markov. So again, it's a state, state space model in which you assume that the sequence of thetas is Markov with two possible values. So you have a, an initial distribution pi and the transition matrix Q. And then given the thetas, the data are independent and they depend, their distribution depends only on the value of the current state. So this is the hidden Markov model. And as I said, what's interesting is in this prior is that it allows everything to be unknown. You do, do not need to know the distribution under the null. You do not know to make uh, shape modeling assumptions on the distributions. So I say uh, that it is a prior, so I use a Bayesian words, but it can be put in a frequentist word by thinking of it as a latent variable. You may think this is the model and you have a latent variable uh, situation. So uh, I'm, welcoming, I'm welcoming everybody, Bayesian and not Bayesian, to, to understand everything here. I will use posterior probabilities to predict the, uh, theta. That is, uh, uh, as we will see very soon, uh, also uh, to everybody. It can be understood as a Bayesian idea or as a frequentist idea. And then, of course, when you use posterior probabilities, you, you know, need to know how to compute them because with hidden Markov models, you will use the forward-backward algorithm. And then you need uh, uh, to, to choose the parameter under which you will make those computations. But I will take uh, estimate for this, to be able to make this computation. And again, well, I wrote empirical bias because I'm coming here today, but uh, I could have just said estimators and it would, it would be okay also. And the idea from the very beginning is that uh, using such dependent prior, we should have better power when the thetas uh, constitute a structured sequence. So I must say now so that uh, this work I will talk about is only half, we've done half the way, so there are still open questions. And uh, the answers of today I will show or only in the setting where you take, you consider that your latent variable indeed follows some model. So I don't know what would you say, Remy, is it fully Bayesian or I don't know. But in the frequentist Bayesian situation where you think as theta is fixed and you describe it using a prior, for the moment I don't have an answer. So first fix, uh, what we want to control, we want to control the fast discovery rate and it's easily described using the fast discovery proportion, which depends on the latent unknown and on the procedure. So you add, you count how many times you have a false discovery among all discoveries. So one, the indicator that phi one equals one or phi y is 
the same. Okay, sub one, which you have zero, I don't care. It's not important because you don't have zero when you often, but write it. Then the first discovery rate can be seen as the expectation of this first discovery proportion given theta. If now you take the average with respect to the prior, then you get the overall false discovery rate, which some could call the Bayesian false discovery rate. But also, you can write it as the expectation of the posterior FDR. I will keep this also, posterior. F dp, you can first take the uh, expectation given the data, and if you do this, you see that, that given the data, you just have the theta i to take, for which to take the expectation, because phi i is measurable with respect to the data. It depends on. So I should put H here. It depends on the parameter you you compute your conditional expectation, and then taking the same expectation, you again come up with the Bayesian FDR. So this is the the thing that I will study uh, during this first part. And then I want to control the FDR and I want to optimize the true discovery proportion. So you don't see it. In which it again depends on. In which you, so it doesn't depend, in which you found the true discoveries divided by the number of true alternatives. So if there are questions, you can ask. Capital H is the parameter. So there is those from uh, the Markov chain and those from the emission distributions. So I keep this. I should have written this also to keep. Then I said we, we will use uh, L posterior probabilities for our procedure. So I will also put that and I will put it here. that I call L values. So if you compute, and again, you need to decide under which parameter you, you compute these posterior probabilities. It is the probability of observing zero, of having zero in the latent sequence given the data. And here the first remark, important remark I have to say is that here, it indeed depends on the whole sequence, on the whole set of data. And uh, using those posterior probability does not depend of, on the mo model I decide to use. Of course, I will talk about hidden Markov model, but all this strategy I discuss now holds for any model in which you want to put some dependent structure or not. If you didn't have them, it would be just xi. But you can use the methodology for other dependence modeling than hidden Markov model. So, why use posterior probabilities? So, there is a very simple reason you could use it. If you think that you want to have a 
small error of discoveries and also small errors of not making discoveries. So these are those two errors when you make a discovery and when you should make a discovery and you do not. And if you want to make small errors, so you can say you wait some differently the two errors. So it reminds you of something. It was the exercise of Remy on Monday. If you minimize this quantity, then you get a decision with the posterior probability that is the bias classifier. So if you take first expectation given x of this, you see that given x there are two possibilities either this one is larger than this one or not so if this one is larger you should take this to be one and if not you should take this to be one so this gives you the decision that uh, if you want small errors you use the bias classifiers, that is, you decide uh, to reject the, the null if this is too small. So this way, you see that the right way to use the posterior is to threshold, that is to use, and this will be the last thing, very important, I use is to use thresholding procedures, that is, you decide the null when the L value is smaller than some threshold. So if you look at this testing, multiple testing procedure. And if you look now at the posterior FDP, you see that if you compute, it's written here, uh, the posterior FDP that is taking this false discovery proportion given X, then you see that if you use a phi that thresholds with lambda, you just add here once when this is less than lambda. So at the end, your posterior FDR is less than lambda, then doing so, you have for free that you have controlled the FDR at level lambda. And this is very general. Any multiple testing procedure you, based on uh, posterior probabilities will have this nice property. But of course, when you do that, you use some parameter h. And then I will not use this parameter h, or, well, I could, it depends on the way I want to, to use Bayesian ideas, but um, I will be more frequentist, maybe. I will use empirical bias. I think data have to tell me something about what parameter to choose. And then I will use an estimator of h to compute my posterior probabilities. So here, uh, the, it's possible to have estimated L values. By using in my, if I do hidden Markov model, I will use forward backward algorithm to compute this, in which I put my sum estimator 
anyone, anything that data driven to compute this quantity. So here you have the data, here you have the data. And then, of course, since I want to optimize my uh, power, I want to make, by uh, when controlling my fast discovery rate, I want to make the most possible discover, uh, discoveries to have a good power. So I will take the largest lambda such that, and I keep this also, such that I control my posterior uh, fast discovery proportion. It's H. So this way I know that I control my fast discovery proportion, not for the moment my FDR. But to compute this uh, threshold, it's very easy since you, you see that when you compute this thing, here you have L values. So this is the sum of estimated L values uh, um, here using H divided by the sum of those who are less than lambda. So in fact, you when you change lambda, you just add a different number of L values, and it comes from the way you order, order them, then here you can just order the estimated L values. And then since when you make ratios of non-decreasing real numbers, uh, the empirical mean of non-decreasing uh, real numbers, then this is a non-decreasing sequence. Then in K, the empirical here just increases. So when you cross T, you know that you are at the level you want to reject, and the lambda hat will be the smallest order L values after which you cross T. Then you, you have set your uh, empirical bias procedure that can be used for any multiple testing. Again, it can be used uh, for any multiple testing uh, situation in which you put uh, um, prior on your hidden structure. So, the hope here is that when you're in a dependent state setting, this empirical bias procedure will often reject more hypotheses than the benjamini hochberg procedure. In, indeed, uh, when you compute your posterior probabilities, what I said earlier is that here you depend on the whole data because you, you put a model such that uh, there is some inference between uh, the theta i's so that given data, there is still dependence. And the question is now, what can we say? Is it possible to get theoretical results about such optimality and uh, in how do they hold depending on the model you've put? So there were parametric results uh, earlier by Sun and Kai in 2009. And now I will show some experiments first, because before proving a theorem, it's nice to, to see that indeed you will not fail by proving just because uh, it doesn't work. So this, those were experiments that uh, were made by uh, Wang, Shojai, and Zhu, and published in 2019. So there is a set of experiments with uh, um, here continuous uh, values for the data with uh, emission distributions, which are modeled using mixtures of Gaussian. So here they've simulated uh, the case of where uh, the null is a standard Gaussian and the alternative is a combination of two Gaussian. They show uh, the, here in the 
Here it's mu, the way they, they choose mu. And then they compared uh, for the FDR and for one minus the TDR, that is uh, the other error, uh, the called FNR. They compared various procedures. There is Benjamin E. Hochberg, uh, which is the black one. So, and you can see that uh, when you use the posterior, the L values with the true parameters under which it was simulated, you get the oracle, which is called the oracle, which is the dark blue. And when you estimate and you use the estimate parameter with non parametric, modeling of the emission distribution, then you exactly follow the oracle. And if you look at the power, then the best power, the less uh, FNR is also both experiments. And if you use count data, you have the same. So this is a simulation where they used uh, poisson for the null and mixture of poisson for the alternative. And you still have the same behavior. You can see that uh, the Oracle uh, controls the FDR. Your estimated, and this is here fully Bayesian estimator, something like uh, Judith could have described, but uh, I'm not sure they use, uh, um, they don't use cut, uh, cut um, Bayesian, they use uh, others. But um, here you see that the full Bayesian um, follows exactly the oracle and that it has the best power. So then you, you feel confident that you can prove something. So the question is now, are we able to control the FDR and does it give optimal power? So if you want to control the FDR, what do you need to prove? So, let's see how I can put this. But what do you want to prove? You want to prove that uh, if you compute your FDR using your posterior and the true parameters, you want to prove that it, that it is controlled as you want. And what you only know is that you control when you use the estimated parameter by empirical bias. This one, you know, it verifies this. So you need to control the fact that uh, both will be closed and that this one you can get to go to pi. So first, using the trick I told you to compute your threshold, you know that when you take the average of all estimated L values, uh, you, are, you, you are more than your FDP, and this will go you can prove, and it's something, that it goes to uh, the proportion of the null that you have. And then,
what you can control is the quantity, which is uh, here, uh, which is the difference of your posterior anterior computed and uh, using empirical bias, and the one computed with the unknown parameter you think your latent variables follow. So when you compute this quantity, you just compute uh, this quantity, where instead you use H, or you use, if you put phi hat here, either for T, A, T hat you use H hat, or for the other one you don't use H hat. So you see that when you make the difference, the only things that come here is the difference between those two, and this is what's written on, the, on the, this slide. The upper bound is just the sum of the difference between Li's and estimated Li's divided by uh, the number of rejections. So the key point here is to understand how you can control to be able to understand how, so this is a general idea, to understand how your empirical bias the multiple testing methodology works, it's needed to understand what's the error pro propagation when you compute your posterior probabilities using some data-driven uh, prior or the unknown truth. So here, uh, this is uh, the inequality Judith talked about yesterday. So we had a paper on that showing that uh, you can control this posterior probability. So here you explicitly use the state space model. So uh, I will not explain details about how you obtain this. But the idea is that when you have a hidden structure, which is Markov, then you have some forgetting properties. This is the power of the rows. Um, so that's you, you, the and then you can prove that the error propagation can be controlled using the errors you make by uh, taking estimators uh, instead of the true parameter. So if I look at uh, this upper bound, uh, for the parametric part, it's easy because when you sum, then there is a geometric sum before uh, the errors in the estimation. But then for the other one, it's more tricky. Here, uh, what shall I keep? Oh. Here you have something where you have to control uh, the denominator together with some uh, uh, estimator at a data point. So there is some way of getting rid of the data point is just to, taking this, to take the sup norm. But then you need to control the sum of something. Yes, it's decreasing geometrically. but then you have the denominator. So when, how can you control this? Do you have an idea? How do you control small values of the density? So what, what I mean is that what I want to control is the FDR computed, taking the expectation of the, and the sum h. You may think of at that as uh, thinking of the fact that your latent follows some hidden Markov model, some parameter that you don't know. So think of it as a frequentist thinking or a full Bayesian in which your hidden structure uh, has a prior that you don't know. But uh, the point of view is that all is, con 
is uh, computed under this distribution. So I call it the truth. So this is why I said at the beginning that this is half of the story. The other half would be to uh, have a, well, in a frequentist Bayesian point of, point of view, to be, to have a fixed sequence with some structure and uh, to understand how things behave if the truth is deterministic. So this story is not written for, more, for now. So here to control, well, there is a, um, a way to control the denominator is you want to, to avoid two, two small values of the densities, then you can use, surprisingly, well, not surprisingly, maybe, an assumption on the moment. Usually you use assumption on the moments uh, to control the growth of the random variables. You say that if you have some finite moment, then you are able to upper bound the probability that the random variable is large. But in fact, since densities are integrable, it allows also to control small values of the densities. So in fact, you are able to prove with the first assumption, if you have some, some moment assumption on your random variable, it's possible to prove that if you take, well, you don't need any, it's a very rough uh, result, but uh, I found it was uh, interesting enough to be said. So say you have some, you have n random variables having some density f, either on a Euclidean space or countable, or on a derivable space. Say, fix that it all. So this goes to zero as soon as you have large enough, uh, was it new? It's one of the new. So. So it's, it's not difficult to prove, and uh, you don't need any structure for anything. It just says that when you control the largest, well, it's, you control how can be, this can be large, you in the same way control how this can be small. And then if you use uh, this assumption, then you can cut this sum depending on whether n minus i is larger or smaller than some constant times log n. If it's smaller, you have the order of log n terms, and then you bound this by something by log n to the power of something because then the denominator is bounded with large probability with the power of log n. And if it is not, then you add things, uh, then you, you upper bound since here you take, you have a, uh, an n number, then you have a power of n, but then since you take rho to the power of at least a constant time log n, you can kill this n and control all this. So this first assumption, just to say that this first assumption is, uh, uh, is used to control the difference between the L values. Then I said that a nice thing with hidden Markov models is that you do not need to decide something about your, the null, you can estimate the null and the alternative, but of course you still have, as in all mixture models, uh, the label switching uh, question, that is you, you, you can estimate both, 
but you have to decide which one is the null and which one is the alternative. So this is some way to decide which one is the null and the alternatives. It's similar as when you compute p-values and you decide which ones are small. You do it the way that when they are small, you reject your hypothesis. And then the other two assumptions are needed to be able to have identifiability of non-parametric hidden Markov models. So the, these two others are specific to hidden Markov. Well, well, for all what I've said, I do not need stationarity. It's just because now I will use estimators and then, well, maybe it's, it can be written without stationarity in a, if you can start with another, but it's not written down. But probably uh, you can do that. But you're right, for now, I do not need the, the Markov chain to be stationary. So the first result is the control of the false discovery weight rate this way. As soon as you put in your empirical bias procedure estimators that have a rate of convergence at least a power of log n, then you control the FDR as you wish. Uh, asymptotically, it goes to the minimum between p and pi zero. Now the next question is whether uh, you have some power. So, do you have some power, uh, interesting power of the procedure? So to look at the power, if I look at the true discovery proportion of talked about earlier. The precise notion of power I will use is not the expectation of the ratio, but the ratio of expectations. And then I will prove, we will prove, we prove some uh, optimality result uh, among all procedures that have some prescribed FDR, but for the FDR, Again, uh, I will use this time ratio of expectations instead of expectation of ratio. Well, in fact, but we didn't write it down. We believe it's similar because when proving uh, how, well, here it was to upper bound the difference. between estimated L values and L values. Uh, in fact, we can prove uh, in a, uh, deviation inequalities so that we prove that these are random quantities, but they concentrate near each other. So that, in fact, taking the expectation in the ratio or uh, of the ratio should not be very different. So the result is the following. You will take the same assumptions, um, four assumptions I've showed before. But then I add some other assumption that if you consider the ratio of the densities F1 over F0 of X1, it has a continuous and strictly increasing distribution function. So you see that this theorem will hold for a continuous random variable. It will not hold for discrete random variables. So this is another part where the story is not all written. Uh, it will cover the simulations with the uh, mixture of Gaussians as alternative, but it will not cover the simulations with Poisson, with con data. And in the situation of continuous distribution, 
Then what does the theorem say? It says that show procedure, phi hat, the empirical bias procedure, thresholding empirical bias, and posterior probabilities using uh, data-driven estimator of the parameter, then you have the optimal uh, true discovery rate among all procedures that control the false discovery rate at the same level, and also among all um, procedures that control the false discovery rate at the level T, you decided to control your procedure. So now the proof cannot go exactly the same as before because what we had uh, nicely for procedure and it, will be, it was built uh, based on this idea, it is the fact that uh, you compute things regarding the post false discovery proportion and then you control automatically the false discovery proportion. Then for the power, it's a bit different. So I will give some ideas of the proof because the last point is very general. The first point, I will talk about it because it's really related to hidden Markov models and it has an, an interesting question in it. And the last one is very general and holds for uh, every empirical bias multiple testing procedure as uh, made as this. So the sketch of proof is the following. Since you do not know uh, what's your observed, uh, you cannot use T hat to control the, first, the true discovery proportion. You have to first show that your threshold concentrates somewhere. Then, using again concentration of the estimators and such things, you can prove that uh, when re you replace the H, uh, you, you still have the same ratios and all things concentrate rate well for the parameter and for uh, the threshold around their unknown value. So I will not discuss this second point. And the third point is uh, something very general, is that uh, you can prove optimality results for these procedures. I introduced them using the bias classifier, but you can prove that they indeed optimize the MTDR uh, at prescribed some MFDR. So first, the first point. So if you want to prove uh, that the lambda hat concentrates, so just think as how you decided to build your threshold. You decided to build it such that uh, you control your first discovery proportion using your estimator. Then if you believe you have some ergodicity, and prove you have some ergodicity, then in fact this concentrates around the expectation of your posterior probability given that it is less than lambda. So the guess, the guess would be that your lambda star such that This is the expectation of your uh, posterior probability given then that it is less than lambda star equals t. Now, if you believe that here you can go to infinity of an expectation and you take the best one going giving t, so it should be exactly t in fact. And this is what you can prove, but of course, uh, here you need to, to say what you're talking about to be able to take, uh, to go to infinity, take uh, 
take the limit as ergodic uh, limits. But to do so, you have, since here, of course, uh, you see that it is not the same object on which you can apply an ergodic theorem because the way it depends on the data changes with n. The position of i says that it's not just a translation. You cannot think it as something ergodic, so you have to relate it to something. And at the end, we relate it to the posterior probability given, well, it's an abstract notion that you can define by Martingale convergence theorem, given the whole sequence extended both to infinity and then on these things, which is a random variable, you can apply ergodic theorems. And this indeed converges to this expectation. But then you want to, to solve this equation you need, well, if you want to prove that you converge to something and that you concentrate near something, you have to prove that you can solve this and you have a unique solution. That, so the way uh, you can do it is that pro proving, of course, this increases when you increase lambda. So you just have, to, it's, in, it's enough to prove that it's continuous and strictly increasing. So if you prove that, then you're done. You define your lambda star, and then you have to work to prove concentration things. And, but this is the good idea. And to prove that you can solve this and that Indeed, this is continuous and strictly increasing. This is where we use the fact that f1 divided by f0 of x1 has a continuous and strictly increasing uh, distribution function. Why? It's because of the structure of hidden Markov models on which you, you know that you have the very nice forward-backward algorithm that allows to compute filtering probabilities and smoothing probabilities. These are smoothing probabilities. So to have the recursion for the smoothing probabilities, which is backward, you use the filter, which is the forward. Then in both equations, you can take the limit, the almost sure limit using Martingale convergence theorem to get the recursion on all the stationarizations of the filter and the smoother. But then when you have done this, you can compute things about uh, distribution function, and then you can prove this. So when you do this way, you see that it does not extend to count data. So it's still open question. Maybe there is another way to understand how this should concentrate. Maybe there is another way. Uh, to prove that you have a unique solution, well, if somebody has an idea to do it, nice, do it. So I just said what uh, is written now, and then you have your Yonda star, which is the limit of the threshold. So this is specific to hidden Markov model. Then the last part of the, of the proof is very general. So I will mm. oh, so I will give it now, so time goes on, so maybe um. So first, we prove that if you take the right parameter and you threshold, then you optimize the power you it achieves the maximum, the supremum of uh, the true discovery rate among all procedures that control in the same way uh, the false discovery rate. 
So how does it go? So this is a very, uh, so the proof of the blue line is all contained in there. So it's a, some rewriting of a part of the proof, which is in a paper by Tabe Aribafka, uh, Etienne Roquin, and Fanny Villers, uh, which was, uh, I don't know if it's published or in the archive in 2019. So I will explain briefly uh, the proof, but it's very general. It's general for any procedure using posterior probabilities, and it has the flavor of the proof of Niemann Person. If you've ever seen Neyman Person, you, if you remember the proof of Neyman Person, then it's just that uh, you have the best power because when you make the difference between power of test having a prescribed level, you make the difference, but you multiply by alpha somewhere, and you, you see that uh, you always you, the, the, the value of the integral is positive, just because you integrate over positive things. So it's a very simple proof. So it was a very nice idea to, to understand that, uh, of course, for that to be positive, then you need to take the likelihood ratio. And this is the same in some sense. You see that uh, the black lines say some expectation is positive and and the fact that the expectation is positive is just because it is a, well, the first one is just rewriting. So you rewrite uh, the fact that they have, you take a candidate psi that has a prescribed uh, FD, FDR, which is not larger than the one of your uh, procedure phi lambda h. So you just rewrite, and that says this. But then the second one is exactly as Neyman Pearson. Next for all i, this inequality, you just look at when phi i is 0 or phi, one, phi i is 1. If phi i is 0, then you know that uh, your, your li uh, is not larger than lambda. Is, is larger than lambda, because if it was less than lambda, then you would reject, and phi y would be one. And you, you, so it's about when phi i is zero, li is not larger than lambda, and then when it's one, then it is less than lambda. And then you look at the signs and the quantities, and you obtain these inequalities, and it's very simple. And then you can deduce from that the last inequality, which exactly says, when you rewrite it, that your uh, true discovery rate is larger for phi. So again, it's, uh, it's very general, it's very simple, it has the flavor of Neyman Person, and it's, it holds for uh, Bayesian multiple testing methodology. Then the end of the theorem goes on using this thing. Uh, so you say that uh, your procedure phi hat has optimal, uh, so has optimal, uh, uh, so the first line is just saying that lambda hat is near lambda star. Then the second uh, inequality uh, is what we just proved. And then you reuse it again, and then you obtain the optimality of your procedure, overall procedures. Yes? Ah. Um. You, you, you know that when you threshold using uh, your prescribed level, you control at least at, at that level, level. So you know that this sup, I, uh, it's not written. No, you can prove it's strict. But you, you can prove it's strict. It was about strict. So I don't have in mind exactly the reason, but not difficult. <laughs> Think a little.
So that the end, that's the end of the story of empirical bias multiple testing. So uh, Bayesian multiple testing is a very general procedure that you can use in any modeling situation and which gives, when you look at it under the oracle, it automatically controls the FDR and has optimal power. To use it, the empirical bias multiple general methodology says that you replace, you compute your posterior probabilities using data-driven things. And you hope, it's the, the hope is that you can control it to prove that it behaves as the oracle. And that's what we've done for hidden Markov models. But since multi, Bayesian multiple testing is a, just an opening, uh, I mean, uh, there are not many works on this, so you can play with this in many other models. Well, there are some people trying to do it, but you can do it also, not so many as, as for multiple testing in general in the frequentist world. I think the Bayesian methodology is much, it's not, uh, there are not so, not so many. And uh, when you play with hidden Markov models, then you indeed prove that uh, you have the same properties as the oracle. And the nice thing is that you don't need to know the null and the alternative, and you can do fully non-parametric things with it. So, as I said earlier, uh, the story is not finished because uh, it would be interesting to understand what happens in the frequentist Bayesian world where the thetas is a deterministic sequence. And this has been done for uh, um, sparse, the, the context of sparse se sequence by uh, Ismail Castillo and Etienne Roquin and Kuku Abraham. And we'd like to do the same for structured theta, but this is still open. And then I will just begin, start the, the story about uh, hidden Markov models. And then here stops my Bayesian uh, word, words because, uh, well, I will just describe what happens with this structure of model and what you can do with it and how you can, well, what's the nice things about this, but then play with it in the Bayesian world or in the frequentist world. That's not a problem. I will focus only on the structure of such models. So maybe there are questions before going into the second part. Yes. So the idea is indeed, you know, so we have two ideas. If you use the hidden Markov model prior, then you, it, it should work well on sequences that have blocks, uh, where the theta i's have blocks of the same values. And then we, we believe it has also a better power for sparse sequences in which, uh, again, you have blocks. When you have discoveries, they are uh, together. For instance, along, well, it's always, having the idea of applying to DNA, for instance, uh, well, things like this, where the, as in multiple testing, you have sparse, you have not many discover, possible discoveries, but uh, theta equals one, not so often, but uh, they, are, they may be grouped. Well, there's nothing more on that, but uh, this was the idea, and, Again, it was uh, the idea uh, uh, of papers on uh, genomic data. Uh, I show Judith because it's her who pointed to me this nice article with the examples and application on real data where it worked. And because what I didn't say about why, why people try to play with non-parametric, I can say it now because it's the topic, but why did people play with uh, non-parametric hidden Markov models before that the theory was developed? Because there were papers uh, uh, earlier. 
it's, it, it's just because when uh, using hidden Markov models, which has a very long history, uh, people used uh, parametric families of emission densities, and they, they were problem of sensitivity or, uh, well, this specification was a problem, in fact. Because, uh, and non-parametric, it was not difficult to build algorithms with non-parametric IDs, and uh, it worked well. That's it. So now I will explain what uh, Judith said yesterday, but maybe it was uh, a bit quick. So now you'll see precisely why those models are identifiable. In fact, there is a proof which is not difficult. So I want to show you the proof. I think in, in, once you've seen it, you won't forget it. So I described the model. So here I don't need to, to have only two hidden states. I have a J hidden states. And the emission distributions do not need to have uh, densities with respect to some dominating measure. You can take any distributions. So, as you did say yesterday, you can all recover all things based on the distribution of three consecutive uh, observations. So here I write, I write the distribution of three consecutive observations. You sum over trajectories of three consecutive hidden states. So you start with the initial distribution, then you uh, transit from I to J, then to J to M. And given this hidden sequence I, J, M, you have your data, which are independently emitted with distribution depending on the hidden variable. So this is very simple. Then if you look at this, you see that it factorizes. This is the main idea. Well, this is one of the main ideas, but this is the very basic thing. You remember this and you remember everything. You factorize through the middle one. Here, you factorize through J. So I've divided just to have uh, distributions, but you, you do not need the, the forget about pi j here. Then you factorize, and you see that you have a sum only of j terms that are tensor products. And then, of course, this object, you do not see it this way. What you can see is uh, functionals of these distributions. So you make functionals of this distribution. So I integrate this distribution with respect to hi of x1 times some k of x2, hj of x3. I said those three ones because these are the ones I will use later and Thursday morning to explain how it's not difficult to estimate things after you've seen that. But you fix the K and then you make vary the H's here so that you have a matrix. You take a finite number of them. So you have a matrix, L times L. And then, of course, here you integrate of H, H, I here of, of a k, it's just a number, and then of a h j, well, and then you see you can write it, so this is the thing you can see on data, and the hidden structure is here. If you remember linear algebra, you have the sum of a j and and blah, blah, and then you write it in matrix form. And it writes exactly this way. So here you have the first, which x1 here. And here it's the last one with x3, the one that was at 
the end left and right of the integral. And in the middle, here you have the k when you integrate over x2. But of course, you have the transition somewhere. You go from state 1 to state 2, and then from state 2 to state 3. So it's, it's an easy formula to get. But then you see that as soon as you can uh, invert O, so if you take k equal identity, you have this matrix here. And if you can invert everything in there, then you put it on the left. And why is it possible to invert everything? It will be possible to invert everything if here you get a full rank matrix. So you can choose your H. You can choose beans, but you can, ch you can choose wavelet basis. You can choose any testing function. So you choose testing function. So for the moment, I use it as a theoretical trick. So if you know that your f1 till fj distributions are linearly independent, then it's easy to see that you can choose j functions like this to have a full rank matrix. Then you have your full rank matrix. First, you have this one, though, so you can invert. And when you invert here, you put it on the left, then you obtain something. So this one kills this one. No, this one kills this one. This one kills this one. You kill one here. And then you're left with this one, which is also on the right. So you really get this. And what do you see here? It's that this, if you fix your H's, and you vary k. So you have, a, for each matrix k, you have a diagonalization with some fixed diagonalization matrix here, which doesn't change with k as soon as you have fixed this one. But you can recover all diagonal matrix as eigen, uh, eigenvalues of this matrix. And this one you can see on data because it's just integration of functions on the three consecutive observations distribution. And you recover all those, and by varying this, you recover this. And as soon as you know the FJs, then you know O, and then you know O. If you know this, you know Q, and blah, blah. You know everything. So the identifiability is not difficult when you, knew, when you know it and when you know how to use it, how to use the, so easy, factorize, and then, well, look, it, look at it carefully and you find everything. So maybe I will stop here for today. Huh? Huh? Je peux encore? I will stop after this, this one. So then you can vary the tensor trick, you know. I've shown it by uh, putting some, uh, oh my god, some precise functions here and only three consecutive observations, but you can use it by taking blocks of observations on the left and on the right, just one in the middle, or you can vary it and vary the functions. And this way you can find other results that it is enough that the distributions are different. As soon as you use more than three consecutive observations, of course you need to use more. You need to use blocks and it's, uh, it's more intricate, so I will not show it. But then you can recover everything only when it's distinct. But the assumptions that Q in full rank uh, stays. And in case, so I come back to my very, very first idea. When you only have two hidden states, it is full rank if and only if the latent variables are in, not independent because you have just uh, two lines in the matrix. 
it's full ranks, full rank. If they are not proportional, they are not proportional. If the conditional distribution indeed depends on the past, so it's really dependence that makes things, things, yes, work. Then when you have estimation, when you have identifiability, you can play with any estimation method. Of course, it may be difficult to prove that it works, but it should work. As soon as you use enough consecutive observations to build your estimator. So I will describe some estimation methods next time, and then I will explain uh, what happens when these dependence assumptions can become false. It can, it can become false. So maybe I stop here. So do you have any questions first before? Thank you.